Got some updates, gonna answer some questions that I get asked a lot, gonna tell some stories, and talk about quite possibly one of the most controversial topics in all of canoe paddling. So grab yourself a beverage, pull up a chair, get comfy, and uh, let's hang out for a little bit. Hey everyone, so I'm currently working on our upcoming documentary about the Minas Link. And if you don't know, the Minas Link is a crazy 420 kilometer long route through Algonquin Park. Quite possibly, arguably the most difficult route through the entire park. 68 kilometers of portaging. It is a crazy route. And we took it on last summer. And I'm super proud to say that we not only took on the challenge and successfully completed it, uh, but we also completed it while filming eight plus hours of raw footage en route, while also eating a plant-based diet. We're not actually vegan, but we thought it would be a really interesting way to do it. And again, I'm super proud to say that we did all those things at the same time. Uh, while also setting the unsupported expedition style record on the route in a time of six days, 11 hours and 34 minutes, uh, just a few hours ahead of the previous record held by Ryan Morin and his paddling partner, George. My hat is off to them for setting a phenomenal time. And the expedition style way of doing it means that we did it by hauling all of our food for the entire trip right from the get-go uh, without things like uh, support crews or meal drops or help en route. It was very challenging to hold on to that um, while also filming and a tremendous story came out of it. So many amazing things happen along the, uh, the route itself and I'm just super stoked to share it. With that said, uh, <laughs> the, the actual process of making the documentary in itself is a massive undertaking. Before I get to that, I should mention uh, it's really important to our sponsors, like very, very important to some of our sponsors, that we communicate to you folks that the Minas Link is not a race. Um, we did it at a spirited pace that was right for us. It was within our ability. We did four months of training for it. Uh, beyond that, we probably did about seven months of planning and preparation for the trip. Um, so just a tremendous amount of work went into preparation for it. Uh, it is not a route for beginners, uh, definitely not a route for beginners. There are some gnarly, gnarly sections uh, of that route that are incredibly challenging. So if you're thinking about taking on the route, uh, make sure that you are well prepared and you do have a fair amount of canoe paddling and tripping experience under your belt uh, because it is, again, a massive undertaking. And a lot of people do the route in, you know, two weeks or three weeks or as long as four weeks. Or some people do it in sections and they, they do one section a year. So... The Minas Link means different things to different people. And again, we did it at a fun spirited pace that was right for us, given the amount of training that we did for it. But again, make sure you plan, you prepare, be safe out there. Back to the post-production side of things and making the actual documentary, uh, that is a huge undertaking in itself. Just a tremendous amount of work goes into a documentary of this size and scope and the expectations for it are set really high because we would like to get it into some recognizable film festivals out there uh, that have bars that are set incredibly high and if I'm being entirely honest, I'm not sleeping very much. <laughs> it makes producing content for the channel on a regular basis, very, very challenging. I figured this would be a great way to maintain a dialogue with you folks. And we could talk about questions that I get frequently on the, on the channel, or we can uh, talk about a story or two, or we can talk about interesting topics. But just being able to sit down and talk with you feels like conversing with friends. And I really miss that. And I don't want that to fade over time as I'm working on this documentary. So I sort of see 
videos like this and doing more videos like this over the coming months as a way to stay connected with you folks. So yeah, thank you for tuning in. Uh, before we get to the rest of the video, I wanted to take a brief moment to thank the awesome folks over at Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. You can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity there. They have a tremendous range of interesting classes on topics from film and video production, to marketing and productivity, to music production, fine arts, animation, graphic design, photography, along with so many other really interesting creative topics. And I'm personally taking a class by Thomas Frank at the moment, who teaches a class on productivity specifically for creatives. And so somebody, as somebody who's trying to squeeze every ounce of productivity out of their life right now, perhaps more than ever, I find that incredibly valuable. Thomas is really good at lowering the activation energy required to get into the creative swing of things. So again, for me, that is a huge win. And it's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. However, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click on the link in the description will get a free trial of their premium membership so you can explore your creativity and give it a shot at no cost to you. So again, clicking on that link in the description really does help out the channel. I'd appreciate it if you could take a look. And a huge thanks to the folks at Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. And without further ado, back to the video. So our first question comes to us from Paul over on Patreon. Hey Paul. Uh, Paul wants to know, when you're filming backcountry trips, how do you balance your filming with being in the moment? One thing that I love about camping is the lack of distractions, so you can just focus on the people with you and the natural world around you. Do you think that filming a trip alters it or takes away from it? So this is a question that I get really often, uh, so I thought it would be a great time to talk about it here in this video with you folks. Um, and the short answer is, it doesn't, but it can. The easiest way I can describe it to other people is filming in the backcountry is sort of like fishing for other people. And instead of catching fish, I'm trying to catch that next beautiful shot or that next interesting shot or a shot that nobody's seen before. And so that's really what what captivates my, my attention while I'm out there. Um, and in the same regard, you know, somebody who fishes in the backcountry would not say that if they're devoting a lot of attention to fishing, the people wouldn't say that fishing takes away from their Algonquin experience. They would probably say it enhances it. Um, and in the same way, filming in the backcountry enhances my experience. Now, if you weren't a filmmaker and you weren't passionate about filmmaking, I can totally see how it would take away from your experience. But for me personally, I absolutely love filming in the backcountry. It makes me more aware of my surroundings uh, because I'm constantly looking for the next beautiful shot or the next beautiful angle. And yeah, so it really adds to my experience. Where it can take away from the experience is in the style in which we film. And in order to convey how it can take away, I had to tell the story about one of our very early filmmaking trips in Algonquin Park. This was almost 10 years ago, five years before we started YouTube. And uh, we took a lot of high-end gear into the Park. We took full frame cameras, we took backup cameras, we took multiple tripods, we took glide tracks, we took just a ton of film gear. <laughs> we ended up setting up and taking down the tripod every like five to ten minutes. Every five to ten minutes we were composing a new shot. Julie would walk by or we'd catch something it, it kind of became like really boring, just like constantly setting up the tripod, taking it down, not going very far, not very, making very much progress. And even though I conveyed in post 
a running narrative or a camping trip. In actuality, I created really beautiful wallpaper, really beautiful moving wallpaper, um, and pieced that together. And I think there is definitely a market for that on YouTube, like a huge market. Like if you just search campfire by the lake, you will find static images that people have just posted of a campfire by a lake running for three hours with millions and millions and millions of views. And I think people tend to gravitate towards that content sometimes when they're just looking for an escape and they want they want some of that ambiance in their life. Um, but it's it doesn't make for a great story. Even though it's very easy to produce, it doesn't make for a great story. And if I'm being entirely honest, the story that we showed people from that video that we produced about 10 years ago was pieced together in a way that sort of conveyed the sense of movement through the land and gave people the impression that we were going on this grand camping trip, when in reality, the video essentially became a series of destinations pieced together because we constantly set up and took down the, the tripod. But in reality, like it just became like boring AF to film. We didn't go very far. It really impeded our progress through, throughout the day. And we both got kind of annoyed with each other. And that went on for about five or six days. And it was a really unenjoyable trip. And what we came to recognize was that filming the journey and filming in a style that doesn't inhibit the journey i.e. trying to film as you're moving and, and filming the actual journey itself means that the trip stays a trip and capturing that and then showing that in our in our more recent films or vlogs or videos whatever you want to call them that is more authentic to the actual experience and we are much happier out there when we convey the journey. And so, yeah, I would really recommend to people try to capture the journey as opposed to a series of destinations because the journey is what transforms people. You know, you, you, I, I guess you could say you're transformed by a destination, uh, but not in the same way that moving through the land does. That's where the adversity is. You know, you, you're either climbing hills or you're paddling across big lakes or you're doing any number of things that are challenging and that's what changes you. Um, and there's a great quote that I love that says, if it doesn't challenge you, then it doesn't change you. Um, and stories are really about challenges that change you. And so that's a story. And the piece of work that we produced about 10 years ago, just completely incongruent to the actual experience. If we're being entirely honest, the actual story uh, behind the video that we produced was two people set up and took down tripods all day long, got really bored. So the finished product for that was completely inauthentic to the actual story. Uh, and now our current works are much, much more authentic to the actual experience. And that just makes for a happier Julia and a happier Chris. And as I've mentioned before, uh, Julia lights up when she's in front of the camera and we love to film out there. Now I will say sometimes we don't plan days that are challenging enough to be told as stories. And what I mean by that is if we end up planning a day that was too easy for us and it was just kind of like a, a lollygag from point A to point B, like it's, that's a wonderful experience for us and it is sometimes nice to convey that to the audience, uh, but it doesn't generally make for an interesting story um, and that's okay, uh, but like sometimes in those scenarios we'll get like a little inventive, uh, for example, when we went on the South Algonquin series and Julia was pregnant, when we booked that trip months in advance, we didn't know where Julia would be at that stage of pregnancy in terms of her, her physical energy. Lo and behold, Julia ended up being really strong out there anyways while she was pregnant. 
out on the portage trail, sometimes with a canoe in the barrel, hauling over 100 pounds, and she was fine. And she was not only fine, but she was happy and, and strong out there. I can remember on the way into the park, and I should say we don't script or storyboard any of our videos. Sometimes as we're driving into the park, we'll come up with a creative idea. And for that particular trip, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be funny if we said that we were going on an epic trip, but then Julia would halt or put the brakes on every now and then and say, hey, I'm pregnant. This is going to be, this is not going to be an epic trip. I like to express my humor through uh, our films. Sometimes it comes through, sometimes it can falls completely flat. That trip ended up being a little too easy for us and going from point A to point B every day. That's probably a good example of where we got like a little more inventive with our shots. But when there isn't an interesting story to be told, I do have to remind people sometimes that like this is just a vacation. <laughs> like we're just going on a vacation and we're taking the cameras with us. Okay, our second question comes from Bernie over on Patreon as well. Uh, I, I've been asking our patrons if they have any questions that they'd like answered. Uh, Bernie wants to know more or less, I won't read the entire thing, but Bernie more or less wants to know if uh, I would consider filming with drones in the park. So this is another question that I get really frequently is, Chris, will you film with drones? And the short answer is I would love to film with drones in the park, but they're simply just not allowed within the park. I have flown drones and filmed with drones in the past. I had one of the original Phantom uh, quadcopters with the old two-axis gimbal. Back in my day, we had two-axis gimbals and not three-axis gimbals. Uh, but the, I had the original uh, two-axis gimbal that went on the original Phantom. And yeah, I flew that thing through the inside of buildings for clients uh, really fast through the inside of a library or through the inside of a performance hall uh, once. Maybe I will get a new drone at some point in the future, but we won't be taking it into the park. So another question that I get really frequently is, Chris, what camera should I buy? And that is an incredibly nuanced question to answer that is very dependent on a number of variables that apply to you. For instance, your budget, what kind of lenses you wanna use, what you're gonna be subjecting the camera to, uh, how durable it needs to be, and what style of filmmaking you're into. Are you into run and gun? Do you want to be fast, lightweight, and nimble? Do you want to carry a bigger camera and also take tripods with you? And if we're talking in generalities, or for example, if you want to know what I film with, all my gear is listed down below in the description. But if we're speaking in generalities, if you wanted to be a nimble, fast filmmaker in the backcountry. Um, a higher budget option would be a Sony a7S III, the camera that I'm filming with right now, the Panasonic G9 or a Panasonic GH5. It's essentially the same camera. Those are some rough options. And then from there, I generally recommend going with like a multi-purpose zoom lens and a fast prime lens. Below that, a budget option would be something like a GoPro Hero 9. I have the Hero 8 and I love it. Uh, GoPro has actually come a long way in the last like three or four years. Uh, ever since the 7 and 8 were launched, they're taking stabilization in camera, electronic image stabilization a lot more seriously. Having said all that, start with what you have. Let the technology come to you. Don't go out and spend a lot of money and then discover that you might not be into it. Just start with what you have. And I so often see people falling into this trap of, if I get this camera, I'll be able to go out and tell this kind of story. And then it doesn't really happen. And I'm telling you right now, working with limitations or limited gear or gear that's subpar will force you to become a better storyteller and force you to get a better image out of the current equipment that you have. And once you feel like you've squeezed every ounce of quality out of your current gear setup or your current camera, 
then think about getting something else. And so for a lot of people, I think that means starting with your cell phone. Just give it a shot. See if you like it. See if you like the process of making films. Try to figure out how to get a better image out of your cell phone. Just keep trying. Learn, make, repeat. Just keep doing that over and over and over again. You'll get better image quality out of the gear that you currently have. That will make you a better filmmaker in the long run than simply going out and buying the latest and greatest. Now on to quite possibly one of the most controversial topics in all of canoe camping and paddling. What kind of footwear should you wear in the park? <laughs> and I want to start off by saying that I have used and appreciate all these forms of footwear and what works for me might not work for you. There is no best piece of footwear out there. Um, your own particular perspective and background will really help inform what's right for you. And I'm going to start off with probably what's the most common form of footwear in the park, a good old hiking boot with a higher ankle, more support uh, for those portages where you might be walking on slippery mud. A lot of hiking boots have great traction. You might have some waterproofness. This is a great way to go. However, this kind of slowed me down uh, coming from a trail running background. I grew up as a cross country runner, kind of like dodging through trees, jumping over roots and running down paths in the forest. And so I kind of felt like this is a cumbersome feel to me. It kind of slows me down. It kind of feels clunky uh, just coming from my particular background. And I find I don't need the ankle support, but that isn't to say they're perfect for somebody else. Next, we have the Keen Sandal, or as some people like to refer to it as the Adventure Shoe. Um, great closed toe at the front for protecting your toes. Uh, fairly decent traction, maybe not as good as the hiking boot, uh, definitely not as much ankle support, but on a hot day, this is a great option. It makes getting in and out of the water uh, in the boat uh, really nice. You know, you get to dip your feet in and then the water just drains out the side. It's, it's a nice option for the backcountry during the warmer months. I might leave them home uh, during the cooler months just because there's no insulation and you're going to get your toesies cold. I do appreciate this option. Uh, a lot of nostalgia around this shoe and this footwear. But this is my new absolute favorite in the backcountry. This is a Solomon Speedcross 5 shoe. You can get it with or without Gore-Tex if you want. What I absolutely love about this shoe is it has the best grip, in my opinion, of all the options. Uh, it's meant for trail running in a high performance environment or scenario where you need a lot of traction and grip. Big giant lugs. Th these lugs are huge and I've already worn them down a little bit. Like they start out just absolutely huge spectacular grip with this shoe. It's almost like wearing a cleat almost. Um, some cross-country runners actually wear cleats to get better grip uh, in mud and I think this is sort of the next best option without wearing a, a full-blown cleat. Great grip in the mud, especially when you're carrying a canoe and a barrel. Maybe you're loaded down with a hundred pounds between the two of them and you're going up say a muddy slippery hill. Uh, the traction on this thing is phenomenal. I also appreciate that it's really, really lightweight. This particular model does have Gore-Tex. It works great. I can't tell you how many times my foot got maybe in an inch of water going down a portage and my foot is dry, nice and toasty. More ankle support than the Keens. Great fit. I think this is also a better option when you're putting in more distance. Um, like for instance, people do ultra marathons in these shoes and yeah, I love the shoe. This is now my go-to backcountry Algonquin shoe. I think I'll wear it on shorter trips. I'll wear it on longer stuff. It just feels really comfy to me. So 
yeah I can't recommend this shoe enough but again what's right for me might not work for you so yeah choose what's right for you and uh, feel free to share down in the comments what you enjoy wearing feel free to comment down in the comments about anything that we've touched on today uh, I really want to maintain a dialogue with you folks and keep a conversation going I've already got the topic for the next video coming up that I'm really excited to talk about so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to stay tuned for that coming up and until then thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time